proposed, to me is just unnecessary. And if the sign doesn't change, ineffective. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Appreciate it. Is there anyone else who wishes to address the town council on this issue? Hi, I'm Ginger Brown Johnson. I live at 4 Ledgewood Lane, and um, my husband, Greg, and I purchased uh, the Veterinary Center of Cape Elizabeth on July 11th, so now it's the Veterinary and Rehabilitation Center. And I really appreciated being able to come to the Ordinance Committee um, twice and, and just speak to them that I did need to update my sign because we have a new name, and, and what could I do to do that? Um, I come from a perspective where I just had my 20th high school reunion from Cape High School and I went to my reunion and I told my friends that I bought the hospital and they said there's a vet hospital on 77. I mean, there is a visibility problem there. A lot of people don't know it's there, even though a lot of us do. Um, I think that the sign as it is now has two inch letters and if we put our new name on the same size sign, we'd have one inch letters in order to stop um, safely by the time you've seen that sign, um, it would need to have three inch letters, which is the same size as you put on um, a street sign, the same size of si uh, number that they recommend you put on your mailbox. Um, so, you know, um, Mr. Bond mentioned that you could go by and, and come back, which is true, but if you saw it too late and you didn't have time to stop and you had a patient in the back that was sick, and you got excited, you slammed on the brakes because you wanted to turn in there. And there is a safety issue to it as well, which I know the Ordinance Committee brought up when they originally thought, well, how much bigger should it be? So those are a couple of thoughts that I wanted to put in your head as well and appreciate your time considering it. Um, you know, we, we also appreciate Mr. Bond's thought that, you know, it, it could be somewhat bigger. And um, I think that the reason possibly that the Ordinance Committee came where they were, where they looked at the, just these four uh, businesses that would be affected um, in a residential zone on 77, and that um, two of them already have signs that are this big. So I think that was another consideration. Thank you. Excuse me. Yeah. How big a sign are you proposing? I, I would like a larger one that's visible. Three-inch letters would be wonderful. Um, with our logo as it is, we could certainly fit that on what the Ordinance Committee proposed, a 20 foot square foot sign. Um, we, that's bigger than that is, so if we find um, you know, that we need to go in an intermediate zone, we can certainly work with that, but I think what they proposed is, is great and, and safe and visible and in along um, accordance with the other businesses that are in a residential district on 77. Thank you. Appreciate it. Is anyone else who wishes to speak to this issue? Seeing none, I'll close the hearing and we'll open it up for discussion amongst the council. Anyone have any questions? Certainly, we, Maureen is here too as uh, staff to support any questions you might have. Go ahead. I, I just want to comment a little bit about the Ordinance Committee's deliberations. What we uh, decided to do as a committee was to allow the signs of a similar dimension that are allowed in the business district along the arterial, which is Route 77. And it is a limited number of uh, properties that would be affected along that route. Uh, and the sign size would be four by five foot would be the maximum size, unless if Maureen would correct me if I'm wrong, but okay. So it would be a four foot by five foot sign. Mm -hmm. I think from my standpoint, it, it, although I certainly appreciate what uh, uh, the former owner of this business had to say, I, I do think it's also a safety issue. If, if people see this, the, the location of this address sooner rather than later, then they're able to stop and pull in rather than having U-turns and that sort of thing happening along 77. So I think it's overall better for the business, uh, better for its visibility. Uh, people then go to the internet when they see that sign, once they learn there's a, a vet hospital there. And I think that's what we wanna try to promote in limited areas of our town. So I, I'm fully in favor of this uh, change to the ordinance. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, David, maybe you can illuminate me a little bit more. How many businesses do we, what might be impacted by this? Well, uh, I think there, my understanding was less than half a dozen uh, that are currently located along Route 77. Uh, was it exactly, was it more four? That's what the applicant said. I, 
I can't recall off the top of my head, but it was not many. Right. It, Go ahead, Frank. Two of them already have signs uh, four by five dimensions. We, um, Maureen, I don't know whether you want to address that. We actually had Maureen out on a rainy day taking pictures of everything in town to share the specifics with us. So Maureen, the question Frank had is. Yeah, we, we didn't do an inventory of every single sign in town and we didn't do an inventory of every single business on Route 77, but if you just kind of drive in your head from the South Portland line to Scarborough, you can, there's not that many businesses. It's short inventory. It's a very small inventory of businesses that are not in a business A or a town center or a business B district. And for example, one of the one was the Walnut Hill Stables. They're already at this size. Um, so I didn't take a picture of every single business in town, but I took a picture of several businesses and was out measuring them. Um, you know, the Inn by the Sea is in a business district. We measured that sign, but you know, everything is like in the in the 20 feet or less size. And the businesses like Walnut Stables um, that have the sign of the size already, do they get a variance to have one that size? I didn't go into the history of how they got those signs. I, in some cases, I made some assumptions that they already had signs that were like that. And, you know, you might have, I mean, because of First Amendment response, First Amendment restrictions, we don't regulate content. Um, we can regulate placement, we can regulate size, we can regulate lighting. So um, the prior business, prior to Walnut Hill Stables, if they had a sign out there, you could replace that sign with another sign of the same size. Has that preceded any ordinance related to signage? Uh, don't know. I mean, I know that, that um, Hilda, Cush Hilda Cushing Dudley owned that place for a lot longer than I've been here. So. Um, and I know that I think the sign ordinance that we have right now is adopted in, I'm going to look at Michael, around the 1990s. So my guess is her business probably did predate the sign ordinance that we had at the time. So they were either grandfathered or they're non-compliant. Right, but I did not go into each sign and check it. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't want to, you know, give you, right. but most of the signs that I did check, uh, you know, they look like they were right in the range. I measured the new Terra sign on uh, Shore Road, and that's, that is a complying sign with our current ordinance. It's a brand new sign. Um, so that's kind of the thing you would see. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is, is, is uh, the doctor, Dr. Johnson, mentioned the one-inch letters and the two-inch letters and the three-inch letters. Well, her sign consultant said what you really want is three-inch letters. Um, if she keeps the name she has right now, she's not getting everything she wants. She's not getting, she doesn't have room for the three-inch letters on the 20-square-foot sign. So um, it does bring the sizes up to what people on, in the town center would be allowed to have, um, but it doesn't give people everything they want. Maureen, um, could you explain a little bit about the logic behind the arterial being the focus? Well, you know, you, you want to try to treat, uh, you want to try to treat like groups in, a, in an even-handed manner. It's this basic fairness and this logic and the whole idea of uh, allowing businesses on Route 77 to have a little bit more signage than businesses on other roads. It, it directly correlates to speed on Route 77 because as you're driving faster, you're not seeing as much and you might want to have a little bit larger sign. But that's at the discretion of the council. I mean, you also can go the other way and just say you're only allowed signs in the business district. It's, it's really, it's a policy decision by the council. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, Anyone? Uh, yes, Jamie. What about in the future if other residential homes wanted to become commercial along 77? I mean, is there a, a limit on the number of homes that we could become there's, commercial? There's not a limit, but there's a limit under the zoning ordinance of you, if you're in a residential district and you're a residential use and you want to convert to another use, you have to convert to a use that's already a permitted use. So there's not a lot of business type uses that are currently allowed in residential districts. So the ability for current single family homes on Route 77 to convert to non-residential uses is already limited by the zoning ordinance. You can convert, for example, to a daycare facility. And then they could get a sign. But um, a new office building would not be allowed in, in the RC district. Anything else? The chair will entertain a motion or I move we approve the um, proposed amendment to the sign ordinance. Uh, seconded. Seconded. Hearing uh, 
A second. All those in favor of the motion? Six. All those opposed? Abstain. One abstention. Um, do you Mr. Chair? want to talk about that? Yeah, it, excuse me for a second. Let me just ask a question. Um, based on that chart. So I'm going to, I'll ask the question. We have a charter that addresses uh, votes of the town council, and I'm asking for the uh, town manager to clarify for us and for those of you at home as well as in the audience what that is. Yeah, the, the, the standard that is, is uh, supposed to work is that everyone, when called for a vote, should state a vote. Uh, a councillor may abstain because of a conflict of interest, in, and usually when there is a conflict of interest, that councillor discloses uh, that they have a conflict and uh, they, they don't want to vote because of a clear bias or because of some pecuniary interest. Uh, so usually either that, that councillor mentions they have a, a uh, you know, a, a bias or an interest, or there's also the possibility that someone else in the council could raise that point and it then moves to a vote uh, with the council determining whether or not there's a conflict. So specifically on this issue, you know, abstaining, uh, you know, because one doesn't want to vote, one wants to duck an issue, which isn't the case here, uh, you know, usually isn't accepted. When a vote is called for, th it's the responsibility of the council councillor to weigh uh, the arguments and to to go one way or the other on the vote. So, yeah. in other words, to be polite, you really should abstain. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't I state a reason for my abstention? Um, I, I have two signs in the business district myself as a as a business owner, both the local buzz and my law office. So. I think that I wouldn't want to color my opinion by my own business interests. So based on that, um, should we have taken that um, item first as opposed to after the fact? I mean, it seems to me that if Jamie had indicated this prior we could have made a decision as a council to allow him to recuse himself from this vote. You, you can still so, do that, Jim, and then, and then you know, call for a revote once you once you've evaluated. Uh, well, given given what the will of the council has been, uh, I'm happy to change my vote to a yay vote because that wouldn't impact my business anyway because I'd be giving them the same rights that I have. No, but I, I think that, you know, what, what's important is that, that you've been upfront and you're ethical in your, your, your conversation and making clear to the public that, you know, you have two, uh, two signs on that road so you really don't wish to, to sort, of, uh, sort of, I don't know, if, I'll, I'll look to the direction of the rest of the yeah, I, I guess my view is I don't see that that creates a, a conflict for Councillor uh, Wagner. On the other hand, I'm, I'm certainly willing to defer when a member of the council really feels like they've got a conflict, I'm, I'm willing, willing to hear it out. And I suppose yeah. the argument could be made that uh, Councillor Wagner might have been influenced to vote against the amendment because that might give an unfair yep. competitive advantage to another district that it doesn't currently enjoy. I don't think that's where he was going, but um, but it sounds like he's sort of withdrawing his request for a recusal yeah. after the fact anyway, so I, I, right. I suppose it's moot. Right. Does anybody else wish to weigh in on the conversation? So um, having Jessica, yes. I was just wondering, and I think you've sort of addressed it, how this would occur once Councillor uh, Wagner has participated in the conversation. Um, before deciding to recuse, I, to me that that's an issue. Um, or, or, yeah, because yes, David. I, I guess I suppose that could be an issue, but now that it appears that he's with, withdrawing that uh, request to recuse himself, I think it, it all it, it all becomes moot. Is the way I look at it. So, so ha having heard this discussion and heard your change of vote. Then it's unanimous. 
Just, just yes. if, if I might, too. I think this, we haven't actually done the official orientation yet for, for, for Jamie, and I, I, you know, I, you know mm -hmm. he obviously naturally knows as most issues, but there are occasionally these nuances that are going to come up, so I think it begs the issue. We ought to get the orientation done. Consider this the first class. <laughs> Yeah. Absolutely. It's easier to do easier. Side, Again, uh, it, what's important is to, for everybody to understand that the process is open, and we, I think the dialogue and discussion has been respectful, and that's good. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item number uh, 29, which is a proposed amendment regarding boundary surveys. Before we open up the... Uh, Again, um, uh, Kathy gets a buy on tonight's uh, meeting because this was done when I was chair of the Ordinance Committee. Um, what we have in front of us for consideration tonight is a uh, requirement for a standard boundary survey. Uh, up to now, we have not required this as part of our ordinance. Back last year, we had to deal with a property in the Oakhurst area that was, um, had an addition built in 1999. And uh, when the folks went to try to sell the property, it couldn't be sold because there was uh, some issues with the, the side setbacks. So what we, uh, the Ordinance Committee had several meetings to discuss uh, what to do about this. And the determination was made that we would require um, a uh, standard uh, survey for uh, building permits of valued of over $10,000. And we gave some latitude to the code enforcement officer uh, to uh, determine whether, in fact, he would require a survey based on um, his analysis of the application. So what we have in front of us is a, um, a recommendation that we now require as part of our ordinance uh, a boundary survey uh, with language that would provide the code enforcement the ability to apply that for properties that may in fact be under 10,000 in building permit value. So hearing uh, the overview, I'll open the hearing. We have any folks who would like to address the council on this subject? Seeing no one, I'll close the hearing and I'll open it up to discussion at the council level. As, yes, Jamie. As under uh, C1C, under application for permits, yep. it <clears throat> says that the applicant shall provide a standard boundary survey if, if any of the following apply. And under A, it says that this code enforcement officer concludes there's a doubt as to the location of the property. And under C, it says the, the building permits request for building building addition or structure valued at over 10,000 are located less than five feet from the minimum setback distance. So in A, you have the CEO concluding about the property line. In C, is it supposed to be the CEO? It's not explicit, but I'm assuming it's the same. Explicit how? That well, it doesn't say the code enforcement officer will determine whether it's less than five feet, whereas in A and B, it refers to the code enforcement officer. Well, I don't know whether it's an, if it's from a, from a nomenclature standpoint, I don't know, would we just add additional language? Is that what you're asking, or more clarity? Yeah, I would think that you'd want to move to add the word, uh, you know, as determined by the code enforcement officer. Um, the, the following paragraph, does that cover it? The code enforcement officer shall have the discretion to require a standard boundary survey quality plan of only property lines within the area of proposed construction instead of standard boundary survey of the entire property? Um, I think that's a different issue, isn't it? Yeah. I, Maureen, why don't you, if you could come up and maybe you could help us with that? Thank you. Um, I think under item C, the intent was to use the building permit that's been submitted. And when building permits are submitted, the applicant is required to estimate the value of the right. project that's proposed. And under the building permit provisions, the code officer always has the authority to look at that amount and determine whether or not um, it's accurate. And then if the applicant is submitting information, the applicants always submit some kind of information on property lines. And what this would do is um, it's really the 10,000 that's going to drive it. 
I mean, an applicant could submit a, a plan that showed that they, let's say they had a setback of 10 feet and they were showing that their setback was 15 feet, they were building 15 feet away, and the code officer could accept that without requiring a standard boundary survey. Okay. Does that help at all, Jamie? Yeah, it does. It does. Okay. Anybody? So it's based on intent. Uh, I think, yeah, C is really kind of a, a bottom line. I mean, the, the, the ordinance right now already provides the code officer with the discretion to require a standard boundary survey. And I think what the council wanted is they wanted there to be a line below which you could not fall. And this, the C actually takes some of the discretion away from the code officer. Um, in other situations, he can or she can still decide they need a standard boundary survey. They have all that authority. But if you're getting a project proposed that's within five feet of the setback line and it's valued at $10,000 or more, you must require a standard boundary survey. Okay. Yeah. Else? And then the only other option is the paragraph underneath where the code officer does have discretion to require a standard boundary survey quality of only the affected property lines, if that's, if that's an option that's available. Hmm. Thank you, Maureen. Any other questions on this issue? Anyone? Uh, the chair will entertain a motion. Uh, <laughs> excuse me, I move that we approve the proposed amendment that would require uh, the survey for building permits as outlined in the proposed amendment. Seconded? Second. Seconded. All those in, oh, you have a question? Yeah, no, I just want to make a comment, and that is uh, that I think this is, uh, I, I just want to commend the Ordinance Committee because one of the things that I thought was particularly wise and reasonable was the uh, giving the code enforcement officer the ability to accept a bound, one boundary line only if he deemed it appropriate. So what that does is spare expense on the part of the homeowner because, you know, we're requiring things that have not been required before. Those will cost money. But by giving the flexibility of allowing one boundary line in, instead of the entire piece of property, again, as appropriate deemed by the code enforcement officer, you know, we're showing, I think, really excellent flexibility and appreciation of the cost of this. Great, thank you. Any other comments? All those in favor of the motion? Seven, all those opposed? It's unanimous. The third hearing on tonight's agenda. Uh, this is a proposed amendment to the miscellaneous offenses ordinance. It's item number 30. And again, uh, Kathy, you get a buy um, because this was done, <laughs> done on my watch. I didn't realize the double duty that you wind up having to do here for a couple, couple of months. But anyway, um, we uh, conducted um, a, um, a couple of uh, couple of three meetings uh, with um, with this subject under miscellaneous ordinances. And uh, we had the, the chief of uh, police, Mr. Neil Williams, participating in helping us draft um, what you have in front of you today. Essentially, um, what we have done here is we have uh, added a disturbing the peace uh, concept of nighttime hours and been very specific as to what those times are. And uh, they shall be from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. Sunday through Thursday, and on weekends, 11 to 7. In addition to this, uh, this miscellaneous ordinance, which is on the books, we cleaned up a couple of other administrative um, changes that needed to be done, one in particular related to um, uh, utilities and having to, um, to replace utility poles or anything to do with um, overhead utilities. Um, at certain times of the day. Again, um, Bob Malley, our Department of Public Works uh, director, um, asked us to clean that up because, again, we, we want to be in complete compliance with this nuisance ordinance. So that's as a backdrop for today's hearing. And I'll open the hearing. Are there any citizens who wish to address this question? 
Chief Williams would like to address us relative to this subject or I've never known you not to want to say something. Come on. Just don't touch the microphone. No. no. I just got back from uh, lengthy illness. So, uh, no, uh, I'd just like to thank the Ordinance Committee because uh, they gave a lot of input on this. Uh, I think this uh, deemed back to uh, short term rental also. And uh, it gives us a little bit more of a handle in. Uh, <clears throat> in going after uh, noise complaints at night time. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you. I'd like to thank the chief for coming in when he was feeling under the weather as well. Okay. All right. Uh, anyone else wish to address this issue? Uh, seeing none. Are there any, any questions on the behalf of the council? Anyone? Yes, Jamie. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to determining what's excessive volume of music or Who's uh, who's making the discretionary call there? Is that the police department? <laughs> you sat down too soon. No, as it is now, it, it would be the officer on duty uh, re responding to the call. Um, and what we do now is we ask the complainant to uh, also sign a. Um, Statement. statement thank you I'm sorry and uh, we would use utilize that also so there would l at least be a little cooperation as far as that goes right. yes David uh, chief just for folks who are watching can you just describe typically how the officer would respond to a noise complaint when he or she arrived at the scene yeah we, what they do is they'll they'll drive down into the area but they don't necessarily will go to that particular or park in front of that particular house and they'll walk over and just stand and listen and see what they do hear or what they don't hear. Um, we have been in calls before where there has been a momentary noise, but um, it, it has dissipated at that particular time. So they'll walk in and then they'll confront the uh, person that's uh, at the house. I, I, you know, this typical thing is at the house usually with, uh, or out in the backyard, there'll be noise and there'll be music. And uh, usually what they'll do is they'll, if it's, if it's minor or it's at nighttime or something, they'll ask them to turn it down. They'll contact the complainant and say, look, at, we contacted them, and uh, they turned it down. And usually we get compliance. It, it's usually not too much of a problem. And, uh, it, but if we do have to go back, we do require a statement so that we can uh, further prosecute. Good. Any other questions for the chief? Frank? My, my apply to the chief or to the ordinance committee. If this, this complaint occurs uh, from a rental location um, and uh, the officer determines that indeed it is, is excessive noise, uh, is the very fact that excessive noise was uh, occurring a strike under the rental, uh, the uh, short term rental, regardless of what the response is? It would is be to? a substantiated. Y yeah, that, that would be determined to be a substantiated. Yeah. And that would be something that we would. Uh, give to the um, uh, code enforcement officer yep. okay. and then then they would investigate right. that as a substantiated complaint right okay. yeah I mean this remember we spent over a year studying the other question and and it was always determined that this should have run in parallel to it to add more clarity and more definition around exactly what the requirements are so that's you know I mean this would have been nice to have been done at the same time right. but we're right on the heels of the of prior decision. So, so even if the renter responds immediately and turns on the music, it's still a strike? It, but again, it'll be determined by the code enforcement officer as to whether it is in fact substantiated. Got it. Yeah. Uh, again, and then the, all of the process that we have in place to, for somebody to argue their case. And I think what you're going to look at is reasonableness. And, you know, if, if we go, I mean, I can't tell you how many times we go to places houses it doesn't have to be a rental house and you know yeah there's they have a few people there and they have no idea that they're making the noise that they're making and as soon as we ask them to turn it down yeah. done right so i mean would we if it was a rental would we ship that to the code enforcement yes we would but i think that reasonableness would be dealt with great so thank you if yeah, i could follow up on frank's question 
um, since I wasn't part of the short-term rental discussion, what effect would that have? And is there a certain like three strikes you're out policy or something? Yeah. Is it yeah, three? It's three. Yeah, right. It's three. Yeah. So my, I guess my concern would be if you had a neighbor who's not too happy with a short-term rental in general, that you can make a few phone calls and all of a sudden have that person in trouble. I mean, that, well, go ahead. Sorry. It would be, have to be substantiated. I mean, you know, we'd go down there. If we didn't find anything, we don't, there's nothing to turn over to the code enforcement office. Okay, I thought I understood. I mean, Jamie, Frank, does... Jamie you're, you're, absolutely, you're absolutely right. The, what we had in place was the substantiation of that concern that it can't just be rapid fire three calls in a row. Right. There has to be some substance to it evaluated by the code enforcement officer, obviously with, the, with whatever input that has been given to him by the police officer. So but is it the police department's responsibility to report to the CEO every complaint regardless of whether or not you thought it was reasonable or excessive noise? No, we, w we wouldn't report it to the CEO um, if we didn't have a complaint. You know, and, and, and I mean a, by a complaint, a substantiated complaint. Right. I mean, we, we get calls all the time. We could go down, it could, get a par it could be a parking issue. And we go down there and they say, uh, we think it's, there's cars that are parked in such a way as to affect emergency traffic. We go down there and think, no, we can get through, fire department can get through, hmm. done deal. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Caitlin wanted to ask a question. Well, just based on what you said, Anne Frank said, about how you go some places and people don't realize how much noise they're making and they respond immediately. Under all these new rules that we have put in place, that's going to get passed on to the code enforcement officer who is going to have to make that a substantiated complaint because you said they were making noise even though they respond. I guess that's my concern is that quick one, two, three. You know, these people don't even realize that they're making this noise. They respond immediately, yet it's still going to essentially have to be substantiated and those three strikes are going to happen quickly even though they did just what they were asked. They, they turned it down and they, they stopped. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that up to the CEO, but from all I have been participating in, it's not a matter of, um, you know, is something happening and is it getting shut down right away? It's a matter of it's happening and we're having a problem and it's not being dealt with. So, Caitlin, just to, uh, to just give you my thoughts on that, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying and we're concerned about all these things as well. And I think that we made a decision to revisit this new ordinance um, this year. And I think that, you know, we've, um, we've, we've at least developed the ability to respond and will respond if we find ourselves in a situation where we have some unsubstantiated complaints racking up against a particular property and it's three strikes and they're out. I mean, we are, we want to make this right, we want to do it right, but we're also willing to respond. So if the thing happens, we will deal with it. I mean, we have a brand new code enforcement officer um, and we all have to work with him and educate him as well. Um, my sense is that you know people are um, people are approaching this in a very professional way on on all sides right now, which is good. So I don't know what else to tell you other than the fact that we are willing to come back and revisit this, and we I think are committed to formally revisiting it um, as opposed to informally doing so on the ordinance committee. So. David, did you want to say something? Uh, I know you made one of the points, but my other uh, view on this is if you're doing short-term rentals and you have three successive tenants, each one of whom causes a noise disturbance, from the abutter standpoint, that's the same as if it's been one tenant all along or the homeowner all along. So although I'm sympathetic to your concern, uh, Caitlin, I also think we, for this to have teeth, we need to have some sort of policy. And I think the three strikes and you're out strikes the right balance. But that's the debate we had already yeah. on the uh, short-term rental ordinance. But, but the caution that's on the table from Caitlin is something we've all ag admitted to and agreed to as, to as to revisiting this question sure. next year sure. with data. So we'll be able to determine intelligently what it is that we need to be doing further. Yes, Caitlin. I mean, Kathy, sorry. Okay. Um, and one of the things that I'm talking about what David had mentioned is when we had the discussion about substantiation, I think that was important because, um, say, for instance, I don't care for somebody 
And so, you know, I hear the tiniest little noise and I call the police, and I hear the tiniest little noise and I call the police. It's an independent um, police officer that's going to say, yes, this is a problem, or no, it isn't. And so um, it, it, it prevents me from <clears throat> disliking my neighbor and deciding I'm going to try to cause some problems there, whether it's a rental or, or an owner. Um, and I think that we had substantial discussion on that, and, and that was important because we were trying to say, you know, we need a third party to say, yes, this is a problem, or no, it's not. And it's not just because I don't care for my neighbor, or, or, or I don't care that my neighbor is, having, is renting the place, and I don't like that either. So mm -hmm. it's about a nuisance piece, and not about whether I like or dislike my neighbor. Did you want to weigh in one more time, Jamie? Yeah. Uh, so uh, have we given the CEO a certain amount of discretion to look at this holistically and make sure it's not a and a butter gaming the system and, and raising regular complaints about the renter. Because if it's mandatory for the CEO to shut this person off from short-term rentals, then I, I would be concerned about some, someone using this system inappropriately. Well, uh, from, from my perspective, um, I would say yes to all of that because that's the role they play. They're to determine the facts and determine whether it is or isn't substantiated. And there are systems in place for them to, uh, to raise the issue to other authorities if they so desire. So I think we've got a pretty tight way of looking at this, yet it's new territory, which I've stated before in this council. So we're going to learn from this. Um, so all I can tell you is, I mean, your, your, your wisdom is good. It's, but we've considered all of that, and I believe with our new code enforcement officer, I would expect that we will, um, we will approach it in the sort of way that you just described, very professional and very open and very straightforward based on the facts. So, yes, Michael. Yeah, I just wanted to remind everyone that this does not simply apply to short-term rentals. This applies to disturbing the peace throughout the community, excessive volume of music, uh, for instance, is specifically mentioned noises uh, which either annoy, disturb, injure, or endanger the comfort, repose, health, peace, and safety of others. So, you know, this could be everyone that has a, a dog that habitually barks every night and just won't get quiet that the police will be able to deal with, as well as, you know, someone who just likes to play loud music every night at, at 2 a.m., whether it's their own house or not, and they don't have the good sense to uh, put headphones on or... or uh, close the window so it you know it's really uh, you know good teeth for both the police department uh, to deal with in, in, in the first instance and it also uh, complements uh, some of the uh, work the council has done as well in the short-term rentals so um, I'd like to move the question um, all those in favor of the proposed amendments to the miscellaneous offenses oh do we didn't get a motion would you like me to make a motion <laughs> yes please uh, I move that we approve the proposed amendments to the miscellaneous offenses ordinance. Seconded. I second. All those in favor? All those opposed? And Deb is going to kick me next time I do that. Or hit me with this. That's probably the best. Okay. Um, item number 31, uh, the Trout Brook Watershed Management Plan. Michael, did you want to? Just very briefly, uh, uh, on, on our staff, Maureen and Bob Malley have worked for a couple of years uh, with the South Portland City staff in uh, the preparation of a Trout Brook watershed management plan. Trout Brook runs over and back the Maxwell Farm on, on Spurwink Avenue and then runs roughly along the South Portland Cape Elizabeth line, uh, you know, over uh, just north of Spurwink Avenue. Uh, it uh, also extends almost over to, to Eastman Road. Uh, it's a very important watershed. It's an impaired uh, watershed, uh, urban impaired watershed. And uh, this, this is a great study and really want to thank the Cape Elizabeth participants and the neighbors and others who have interested, but particularly want to thank the City of South Portland for their uh, leadership on this, on this program uh, and for their support throughout the process. Do I have any, I have a motion? 
Jessica? Uh, I, I move we approve the Truckworth Watershed Management Plan. Seconded. Jamie? There are any questions? Yeah, I should, yes, I should have mentioned come. you had a presentation on this. Uh, yeah, I was just going to work yeah. Yeah. We did. Just if, if uh, this is actually for uh, the town manager, but it, just for the audience here in at home, could you just briefly review the compensation fee utilization plan that Cape Elizabeth is going to enact should we need to help fund this? I'm going to do Page something 12. that would be smart of me to do, and that's to refer that question, if you're willing, to Maureen, since... Uh, well, I've been briefed on this a couple of times. I, in preparing for the council briefing, I indicated I didn't know as much about it as I should have. The compensation fee utilization plan is something that the town has already adopted. And the reason we adopted it is because of state regulations that change regarding stormwater. Um, if you have a development in your town that triggers site plan review in an urban impaired watershed, you must pay a stormwater fee. And you can either pay, you can eat, uh, and you don't have to pay the fee. You have to actually find a project in the watershed, and you have to make improvements so that you're increase you're improving the 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 stormwater quality. So there's two ways to do that. Either you can just go and find the project, or you can pay into a fund. The town of Cape Elizabeth had the Eastman Meadows uh, condominium project. Uh, submitted, it triggered the stormwater requirement at the DEP, and the applicant's choice was to find a stormwater improvement in the watershed. And frankly, that improvement, if he were to go that route, would have happened in South Portland, or pay a fee to the town of Cape Elizabeth. So we actually created this fee utilization program, and we took the fee, and it's sitting in the town of Cape Elizabeth budget where we can use that money to improve stormwater quality in Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. You're welcome. $25,000? $25,000, yes. Maureen, what, uh, what has South Portland done? We, were, we talked at our workshop about did they approve this? I don't know if they've done if they've approved it yet, but they really have been the driver. The the vast amount of um, effluent that's going into the brook is coming from developed areas that are in South Portland. So we're making a contribution to whatever's not so nice in the water, but most of the not so nice stuff is coming from the South Portland side. So they've really been driving the bus in terms of uh, applying for grants, doing surveys of the watershed, and uh, we've been benefiting not only from their drive, but also from the fact that they have uh, full-time people working for the city who do nothing but stormwater management. Any other questions for Maureen? Just, I, I did want to mention the import of the council adopting this or approving it is that then this then allows both communities to move on to next steps, possibly applying for grants and and uh, you know trying to do other things to to uh, enhance this watershed. Any other questions? Yes, Jessica. Yeah, and the other part of that that was pretty interesting when we had the presentation was there were, there is going to be a significant um, public education and outreach to people with septic, uh, septic uh, programs or even just where they, uh, how they deal with their lawn clippings, things like that, that would all be voluntary but also part of that program. So it's very good. Great. Any other questions for Maureen? We have a motion on the table. Thank you. It's been seconded. <laughs> Move the question. All those in favor? All those opposed, unanimous. Number 32, the Greater Portland Economic Development Corporation Protocol. In your packet, you have a two-page handout discussing the purpose and protocol. Um, is this requiring a vote, Michael? Yes. Uh, the Greater Portland Economic Development uh, Corporation, which consists of Falmouth, Portland, Westbrook, South Portland, Cape, and Scarborough, uh, uh, trying to make sure they don't compete with each other for economic development. Uh, and that there's a protocol in place that when inquiries come in, that we, we don't get, we try to have open communication. We try not to get in situations where one community is outbidding the other for this particular business. We also wouldn't poach <coughs> another community's prospect if you, we heard that another community was looking. Clearly, this has little effect on Cape Elizabeth. Uh, <laughs> But at the same time, as a resident of the region, 
they've asked us to join in in, in signing on to the protocol. But uh, you know, we, 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 we were not anyone that was offending the, the good <laughs> sense of everyone to begin with, and yeah, yeah. going after trying to recruit some of these businesses. But Michael, we have a new counselor now involved in this. Jamie, yes, Jamie, Jamie Wagner. Wagner. So, so we we have high expectations. <laughs> so, um, I'd entertain a motion. If there's any, Jessica. Yes, sure. I move that we uh, approve the or adopt the Greater Portland Economic Development Corporation Protocol. Seconded. Jamie. Any discussion? No. Is this a result of uh, a new executive director, or is it? Yeah, but it, uh, Tom Turner did work on this, but it, mainly this was a product of a continuing set of meetings of the economic development directors of each of the communities other than Cape Elizabeth. Okay. So Jamie, we're expecting you to add some input into this going forward. I'm sure. I, I've been in contact with them already. They've they've, they've been circulating emails to Good. to me. Uh, so far, you know, we we haven't had the 20,000 square foot facilities that they're looking for to move new businesses into the state. But okay. Uh, all those in favor? Unanimous. And the next item on our agenda is number 33, the draft town council goals for 2013. Um, so I just uh, look to a um, direction from the council here. Um, we have some folks in the audience who I'm sure would like to address or add their input into this draft. Um, I, I'm just looking for some direction as to whether what the wish of the council might be on this. Should we move the question, second it, open it to discussion? What would you, what would your, what, what's the general feeling here? David? I don't have any strong feelings, but it would be fine with me if we allowed the 15 minutes that we would allot to an agenda item mm -hmm. to occur now with folks speaking their three minutes and then we could mm -hmm. have a motion. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Comments, thoughts? That would be. Do we need to take a vote, Michael, on that very issue, or are we just? No, the council rules already provided. Okay. All right. So why don't we just open it up to 15 minutes? If you're interested in addressing our council goals for 2013, uh, we ask you to address uh, us at the podium with your name and uh, your address, and uh, you've got three minutes. We'll limit the entire conversation to 15. So if anyone would like to address the council on the council goals, please feel free to join us at the podium. Nobody? Okay. Great, thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Molly McCoslin. I live at 37 Park Circle. I'm a TML trustee. I've sent you all a letter this week. I've heard back from several of you, thank you. Um, I don't know whether to be heartened or disheartened by how extensive your goals are this year, but I was encouraged to see that the TML was first on your list, thank you. And I'm not sure whether Ruth Ann is going to say anything in addition to what I have to say tonight, but I would like to thank you all for um, considering how we're going to move the project forward in the upcoming year. and. We'll look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address us? Free microphone, come on. <laughs> well, okay. Well, again, um, we appreciate your interest in coming this evening, even though you don't wish to speak to us on the subject. Um, and again, I appreciate the Council's uh, allowing us to add this uh, these to our discussion. So um, I would um, entertain a motion um, on the goals, and uh, unless we think there's further work to be done. So what you have in front of you is a proposed set of goals for the upcoming year. Anybody wish to move to adopt these goals as our this draft um, for our work plan goals for 2013? Seconded by Caitlin. Is there any discussion? Like, now I'm going to sound like a lawyer, but these are sort of our goals as we sit here today. Uh, things can change over the course of the year, so sometimes the council might go in a different direction. But 
I think these are a good set of goals to start the year out and I uh, look forward to working on all of them, especially the library. So there's a lot of learnings last year. <laughs> uh, so you weren't sound, sounding very lawyering. You were really just experiencing the learnings. Um, you know, I had one about when we uh, talk about roles and responsibilities of volunteers on local boards and commissions. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know whether I want to make that happen here, but maybe it's worked outside here. But I really think we've got to talk about what the roles and responsibilities are of people who are on our boards and commissions, volunteers. They understand what they're, what they're supposed to do and how it's supposed to work. It's not just running good meetings on the part of the chairs on the next page. It's about the individuals on those commissions understanding better what their roles and responsibilities are. So we are going to look at those a little more um, comprehensively this year. But I, I really feel, especially as it relates, and I can say this, to our zoning board, I've been observing this over the last several months, and I've been really concerned um, that the roles and responsibilities have to be clear and what people are supposed to be doing in their role and responsibility and um, feeling that, that they're adding value as opposed to, you know, maybe not so much in terms of value, more uh, clarity, if you will, around the job. So I, I, I look forward to that, that particular goal. But, you know, I appreciate David's comments. Does anybody else want to add anything? I just wanted to say uh, one thing. I might. The Shore Road pathway, a lot of folks, and the no reason I mention this, we've gotten quite a few emails, a lot of folks have asked about the section between the old main gate and the current <coughs> entrance to Fort Williams Park and how come that's not done, why it wasn't included in the plan. Well, the, the reason it wasn't included in the plan, it was only so much money and it wasn't part of the original plan. The sense was to connect <coughs> the, the fort to the town center, that was the original plan. The town council did authorize us to begin work uh, to look at putting that section in. Uh, surveying already had begun just before the snow hit. Uh, and we're also looking at the section on Shore Road between Cottage Lane and Surf Road across from the old post office. Simply being that if, uh, if the section between the two fort entrances is done, park entrances, then that next section would be the one everyone would ask for, is how come that's the only section of Shore Road that doesn't have a pathway or a sidewalk. So anyway, I'm hoping that sometime in the spring we'll, be, we'll have a cost estimate and something you to consider during the budget process. Uh, to uh, put in those final two sections of the pedestrian uh, availability along Shore Road. Great. Anything else for the good and welfare? The, you know, the Thomas Memorial Library is number one on the agenda, and it is on our town council workshop agenda this Thursday evening. So, uh, and, you know, we've had some conversation about it already, and I think uh, I look forward to the, this, uh, this discussion and uh, hopefully some strategy and, uh, and a plan. Okay, uh, any other conversation? Having, I would like to call the question, all those in favor of the proposed goals for 2013? All those in favor, all those opposed? Seven, uh, unanimous. Okay, the next item on our agenda, number 34, but it seems to me we probably have to take up citizens' opportunity for discussion of items not on the agenda. This is the second opportunity for citizens to speak to us about items that are not on the agenda. Seeing none, then we will move to item 34, mm -hmm. the town manager's annual evaluation. It's recommended the town council in conformance with uh, 1 MSRSA 4056A enter into executive session to begin the annual evaluation of the town manager. Entertain a motion. I move that we enter an executive session <clears throat> to uh, begin the annual evaluation, evaluation of the town manager. I have a second. Second, Frank. All those in favor? Unanimous. The chair will entertain a, uh, I guess we don't, uh, we have to, we, the adjournment after. after. Okay. That's great. Thank you very much. And. Uh, We'll go out to the Jordan Conference Room. Thank you. Is this your 2012? The last yeah. year? So